Hello, I'm Dr. Egdan Rashad, and you are listening to the Psychopharmacology Institute podcast. We are an educational platform that is passionate to help you, the mental health clinician, become a better prescriber. Join me every two weeks where we learn about interesting and clinically relevant topics that you can apply right away in your practice. Before we get started, why don't you go to piupdates.com to sign up on our website, earn CMEs, and receive regular Psychoform nuggets of joy. PI stands for Psychopharmacology Institute, by the way. So go for it. In the last episode, we ran through the basics of pharmacogenetic testing, or PGX for short. I suggest you check it out first. Today, we will get into the nitty gritty and learn together how to make or not make decisions based on PGX. Let me go through today's topic using a case vignette. You have a 56-year-old patient with depression that doesn't seem to be responding to two adequate trials of antidepressants. You've tried augmentation and psychotherapy with only modest improvement. You have a light bulb moment and decide, hey, why don't I try pharmacogenetic testing? I have a free kid in my office. Let's do it. With a spring in your step and hope in your heart, you order a PGX test for your somber patient. You smile to yourself. You're a real hero indeed. One week later, you get the report. You don't understand. What's all this? 2D6, 2C19, 2C9, 1A2, 3A4. You see blotches of red, yellow, and green on the report. You take a sip of your bitter coffee and take a deep breath. Okay, let's figure this out. Pretty dramatic scene, eh? Well, let's help our puzzled friend here. We have Dr. Michael Face from the Perlman School of Medicine giving a very nice and simple intro to the PGX result panel. So there are five or six inherited variations in how the liver metabolizes medicines that are relevant to commonly prescribed antidepressants. And so knowing if your patient is an extremely rapid metabolizer or an extremely slow metabolizer through one of those polymorphisms would be helpful. There are also maybe as many as five or six inherited differences in how antidepressants work. And so, for example, the serotonin 2 receptors under polymorphic control and the serotonin transporters under polymorphic control. And there's an um, enzyme in the brain that helps metabolize uh, folic acid into methylfolate that is under polymorphic control. Okay, so most PGX panels show you whether your patient is a poor metabolizer, an intermediate metabolizer, a normal, also known as extensive metabolizer, or an ultra-rapid metabolizer. Each cytochrome enzyme has its own flavor, or in proper terms, phenotype. Some are fast and some are slow. And that's the first part of the report. The second part of the report suggests to you, according to the above phenotypes, which drugs are in the red, the yellow, or the green. So the green is for meds you can use as directed. The yellow is for meds you can use with caution, and red is for meds you can use, but your patient will start frothing ketchup from every orifice. Okay, I'm kidding. Sorry. The red column is for meds you can use with an increased caution and frequent monitoring. Chill, okay? Other things I tell patients is if a lab gives you a report of what medicines to use or avoid, remember that that's a theoretical list and it's mostly pharmacokinetic based. So sometimes patients are very wetted and they get this test and there might be some colored columns like red, yellow and green. And the patient is so convinced that they should not be taking a medicine that's in the red category when in fact, a medicine in the red category would be reasonable to use and might really help. That was Dr. Simon Kung from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He's right about patients getting panicked at seeing a med listed in the red. Go on, Dr. Kung. So this was the subject of a case report that was presented in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2017. 
in which there was a 25-year-old patient with schizophrenia and clozapine is what was recommended, but the family and the patient psychiatrist said, look, you know, this clozapine is in the red column. We're not going to use it. And in the end, the patient did use clozapine and did get better. So remember that those lab reports are, are not always an indication of we must follow this down to the very letter. An excellent point. That PGX panel result is not the Ten Commandments, okay? So is there some sort of divine PGX guidance we can follow? I mean, evidence-based guidance, sorry. So the FDA does have a lot of guidance on these pharmacogenomic tests for certain medications. And if you go to the PDR and just look at the PDR information, that will also show, for example, on Trintelix, which is vortioxetine, it will say right there that P450 2D6 poor metabolizers should take only half of the dose of Trintelix. PDR is the prescriber's digital reference. You can go to the website to check it out yourself. It is pdr.net. Any other sources to go to, Dr. Kang? There are some general clinical recommendations that I use, and these are really based on what the CPIC, which is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, recommends for their guidelines on 2D6 and 2C19. Those recommendations consist of if the individual is a normal or intermediate metabolizer, then usually there's no need to make any medication adjustments. Typically, we make the medication adjustments only if the person is a poor or ultra-rapid metabolizer. Sometimes we'll try to avoid the medicine if it's a poor or ultra-rapid metabolizer. If we don't want to avoid that medicine, a lot of times for poor metabolizers, we'll just target 50% of the usual dose. And for ultra-rapid metabolizers, you might need a higher dose. Of course, if the medicine is a tricyclic and you can measure blood levels, that's another way to see how much dose you can give to the patient based on the drug level in the bloodstream. And another thought is to avoid using medications which might inhibit or induce some of these enzymes. So medicines such as omeprazole or cimetidine. All right, let me summarize the CPIC recommendations that Dr. Kang just mentioned. If your patient is a 2D6 and 2C19 normal or intermediate metabolizer, don't do anything. If the patient is at extreme ends of the metabolizing spectrum, then either you make dose adjustments or just avoid medications that are metabolized by them altogether. For poor metabolizers, you can target 50% of the usual dose. And for turbo-powered metabolizers, you can use a higher dose. Also, keep in mind the drug-drug interactions. At Psychopharmacology Institute, we have this cool nugget of educational joy called expert consultations, where we host faculty and grill them on every applicable question in a snappy and crispy way, unlike my theatrical rambling over here. Anyhow, my colleague, Dr. Dana Wang, delved a little deeper with Dr. Kung on interpreting PGX results. Take a listen. How do you interpret those data that you get from a genetic test to help with your clinical decisions? I usually look at 2D6, 2C19, and serotonin transporter gene. 3A4 is usually normal, 1A2 is frequently rapid, and 2C9 and 2B6 aren't as involved with our psychiatry medications. If 2D6 or 2C19 are poor or ultra-rapid, I change my medication strategy. If serotonin transporter gene is short slash short, I make sure the patient has been on medications other than SSRIs. Many of these pharmacogenetic panel tests nowadays come with some classification as to whether there might be gene-drug interactions. It's important to use these as guidance, but to know that they are not absolute use or do not use, or predictions of what will improve depression. In November 2018, the FDA issued a warning about genetic tests claiming to predict outcomes from medications, saying that they have not reviewed these tests and there might not be evidence to support the claims. There's actually more evidence now that panel testing helps, such as Dr. John Greedon's guided randomized trial published in April 2019 of about 1,100 patients, which showed more response and remission in patients with a pharmacogenetic panel test, although the continuous depression rating scale was not statistically different. 
But we have to keep in mind that more data is needed to be conclusive about how pharmacogenic testing can help our patients. So in Dr. Kung's practice, he tends to look at 2D6, 2C19, and the serotonin transporter gene. The FDA did indeed publish a safety communication letter directed to patients and doctors, telling them to be aware that, quote, most genetic tests that make claims regarding effects of a specific medication have not been evaluated by the FDA. So take it all with a grain of salt. I'll share the link to that FDA statement in the references for you. As you know, another indication of PGX testing is if the patient is experiencing unusual or extreme side effects. Dr. Wang investigates whether side effects really are an indicator of metabolism. How well is side effect profile correlated with the rate of metabolism? I mean, if someone experiences more side effect than normal at a low dosage, is that evidence that they may be a slow metabolizer without knowing the genetic makeup? When the field of psychiatric pharmacogenetics started, the thought was that poor metabolizers might have more side effects. It turns out there's not good evidence to support that hypothesis. The CPIC guidelines do reference some studies which were of weaker quality supporting that hypothesis, but overall there's no good association. In a 2015 study of 868 patients receiving nortriptyline or escitalopram, 2D6 and 2C19 genotypes did not predict total side effect burden. Some side effects were associated with serum levels. And while genotypes have been associated with serum levels, we can't make that leap to say that genotypes are associated with side effects. So if a patient comes to me with more side effects than usual on low doses of a medication, that doesn't reliably mean that they're different in their P450 genotype, but I would still consider doing the testing. Aha! So the evidence is weak when it comes to correlating between side effects and drug metabolism. Note that one down. And that's about it for today's podcast. How did you find that? I'd love to hear your feedback and comments on today's episode. Email me at podcast at psychopharmacologyinstitute.com. Now we have the key points right out of the oven. Pharmacogenetic testing results are a theoretical list. Keep that in mind when prescribing. You can use resources like PDR and the CPEG guidelines to help you use PGX testing soundly. No medication adjustments are recommended in patients who are 2D6 and 2C19 normal or intermediate metabolizers. If the patient is a poor or rapid metabolizer, avoid the medication if possible or make dose adjustments. For poor metabolizers, you can target 50% of the usual dose. Experiencing side effects does not necessarily correlate with being genotypically a poor metabolizer. Now listen up for the podcast clinical case. You have a 45-year-old patient with treatment-resistant depression who you have been seeing for some years now. He has recently read about how intranasal esketamine was FDA-approved earlier this year. He would like to try it. What would you, as a clinician, be most concerned about with esketamine? Send us your answer at podcast at psychopharmacologyinstitute.com and we will discuss the answer in the next episode. Did you know that a lot of today's content was extracted from our CME presentation entitled Pharmacogenetic Testing in Psychiatry? Check it out on our website. Visit piupdates.com and become a premium member already. We have a bunch of CMEs for you to collect. If you are a psychiatrist in the US, we also offer SA credits. You can also go to our website and join our newsletter to receive weekly updates delivered straight to your inbox. Join me next episode where I'll be discussing ketamine. See you there. The following people participated in this episode. Dr. Flavia Guzman as a general editor, Andy Rode as the audio engineer, Pamela Gonzalez as a project manager, and myself, Dr. Wagdan Rashad as the host. We'd also like to thank Dr. Simon Kung, Dr. Michael Face, and Dr. Dana Wang for being with us. Thank you for joining us in today's podcast. Until the next episode, goodbye. <laughs>